Okay, check one, check one, two, check one, two. Let me know if I am audible. Let me know if you can hear me. It feels like it's been a really long time since I've... Let's go, been a while, King. Oh, I need that subscribe sufficient data for this. <laughs> Not sure what you mean, though. Oh, I need that subscribe sufficient data for this. Why am I, what am I, what am I missing there? not reading that correctly but welcome everybody thank you for joining me on the king's monologue and i hope you can all hear me just give me a, a yes if you can hear me okay um and if the screen's fine yes thank you joe okay that's good enough superb so we're live and i uh, hope the volume's good and everything and today you can see the subject anyway fantastic thank you for the feedback talia and all who are joining me today um, you can see the, the, the topic for today. It's a, it's a bit, it's not going to be a very a really deep or in-depth one. I'm hoping I say this all the time, this, you know, <laughs> famous last words, because every time that I try to start a live stream and say this isn't going to take very long, we end up being here for hours and hours on end. But that certainly isn't my intention. I just want to show you, um, it's a bit of a revelation that I came across, actually, in regards to hair on the African continent. And I want to share it with you straight away because it actually confirmed some things that I had that were my suspicions in regards to what we see so often. Well, not so often, actually, but what we see in a few um, Kemetic or ancient Egyptian mummies. You know, we, we see certain traits. And I've, for those of you who want a kind of a more well-written explanation, I've already done a video on this um, where I touch on you know, the different colours of hair and the different textures of hair. And I'm going to say right now that I stand by every single argument that I made in that video. And this live stream that we're going to do today is just going to somewhat um, substantiate it, okay? Um, and hopefully this gives it some, gives more weight and more evidence. Because you know what's beautiful about... Um, cultural continuity is that you just have to be in tune with people like you in the community but just in tune with africa and be in tune with the continent and you see it it's just it's almost as though the culture our ancient cultures continue to live on in africa but the greatest tool that's been used to separate you know, melanated people globally in the diaspora, whatever you want to call it, from, you know, their heritage and their ancient culture is just not talking about it. It's, it's the most amazing thing. None of these things have been erased. They're just there for everyone to observe. They've never stopped being practiced. And I've got a much lengthier video and much more in-depth video on the way about cultural continuity. And I know I've been promising this for a few weeks now, but the reason this video has, you know, been... A work in progress for for a long time now is because it's a never-ending piece of work every time i think i've gathered enough data or gathered enough research to do my video on you know cultural continuity between Nile valley civilizations and modern african cultures and ethnicities i just get more and more stuff and i'm just like oh my god i've got more stuff now oh my gosh like i, I already had enough and it's amazing because the 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 the, con the continuity between 
um, continental Africans and Nile Valley cultures are just literally limitless. They're literally limitless. Yet if you look in other parts of the world, outside of Africa, you won't see any. They'll tell you that, you know, Nile Valley culture is a dead culture and, you know, they'll act like certain things that existed in Nile Valley civilization are big mysteries now. Oh, what is this mysterious hairstyle that they had? And oh, what's this mysterious practice of carrying baskets on their head? It's like, dude, come on, this is, this is what we do. Okay, this is, this is alive and well. This is just African culture. So greetings to everyone who's joining me today um and we're, we're gonna get into it we're gonna have a bit of fun today and i really really um am glad to be back <laughs> i say being back actually just to give a little bit of an explanation i was on holiday well i went on holiday um a couple of weeks ago for a week and then since then i've been back and i've been trying to get my content together but even before the holiday i had gone a bit quiet so it's been about nearly three weeks since i've posted pretty much anything and it's almost like um i don't know if you've heard of um what's it called is it is it information paralysis analysis paralysis maybe it's a bit of analysis paralysis because i've got so much now building up that i want to do if you look at if i could show you my backlog of you know um, work in progress and research and i've bought so many new books as well i mean in the last i would say in the last month i've probably bought about 20 maybe just over 20 new volumes and i'm trying to get through each of them they're so each of the books that i've bought is so exciting or more exciting than the last book i bought and so i pick them up straight away and start reading them so <laughs> just you know pray for me i'm i'm all over the gaff <laughs> at the moment but I, I promise you when the content comes i was saying it to someone in my patreon i said well, hopefully i think it was actually kelnari i was saying it to no no it wasn't it wasn't it was firefly who is not here but i was saying when it rains it pours so when i do come with the content i have a feeling there's going to be a lot to come but anyway uh let's get this underway um so i'm gonna actually attack this comment over here when i say attack i mean in the nicest way possible because i know that you're just answering a, a question you're just asking a question here but i think you've said something that's really really poignant okay so i hope you can all see that comment on the screen says, uh, thank you for posting this, by the way, Kofi. Um, I did notice that the ancient Egyptian mummies has European hair and wanted to know if it's true, if that's its real hair or is it a fraud? Now, this is the question that we're going to tackle. So I'm going to leave this on the screen because it's quite important, actually, that we, we, we tackle this perception. And I'm going to show you where this perception comes from. Um, and a lot of it is just based on not having a full knowledge of you know african culture and african phenotypic diversity which i speak about a lot but also the the ways in which africans manipulate their hair particularly the in ancient egypt there's got to be you know little bits of science here today so just you know stay with me okay because this is going to be it's going to be a good one all right so let's start off so to start off with i'm going to just show you um a reconstruction that I've done or my latest reconstruction that I've done of Queen T because that's really where this all started so I'm just going to quickly share most of you have seen my latest reconstruction of Queen T it's in the um, thumbnail so you should have seen it there and I'm just going to pop it on the screen for everybody to see as soon as I find my folder which would be really cool here we go <laughs> so this is my latest reconstruction of Queen T Let's go for this one with the crown on, first of all. So let's double click, that should load up, there we go. So this is my latest reconstruction of Queen T. Now those of you that know me know that I really like this. This is probably one of my favorite reconstructions because of the amount of work. If you go back from my work, you'll know that I have previous reconstructions that predate this one. And this is my latest in, in a long line of reconstructions. I really like the way this fell because actually when I just created this, it did take on all by itself a very Nubian look. Um, I actually have a Nubian friend who looks not too far from this. <laughs> um, but it's got kind of a, a, a Nubian, a Nubio-Sudanic 
kind of look. Um, I think a lot of people will say that also maybe has a an Ethiopian or a Kenyan look to it. But, you know, there's that kind of just that cultural continuity throughout all of, I would say, East slash Northeast Africa. You can you can just see it there. And I really like this reconstruction because once again, I just I just create the reconstructions and then the I, when I started off, the, the, the base kind of features that I started off, they weren't East African at all. But as I just obeyed what I saw, as I obeyed what I saw in the bust and I tried my best to replicate it, it ended up looking like this. So that in itself is actually something, okay? That actually is, you know, something quite significant because it means that if we just honour the artwork as it's being presented to us by the um, Kemetic people, then, you know, what I believe to be their true faces will almost start to jump out at us. Now, the question of hair comes in because we're talking about Queen T now. And to give you a bit of background, I'll, I'll just pull up the mummy or what they believed the mummy of Queen T to be. So I'm just going to pull that up on the screen. And there's so much to cover here. So I'm going to try not to get myself a little bit overwhelmed here. So this is the mummy or what they believe to be the mummy of Queen T. Now, actually, I, I'll be quite open and frank with you. When um, I, d I started doing my research, I initially didn't believe this to be the mummy of Queen T. I thought it was just the mummy they found and they chose. But actually... Having done the process of actually overlaying this with my reconstruction, I do that in my very, very first Queen T reconstruction video. It does overlay quite perfectly. She has exactly the same downturn of the lips. Um, you can't see it because the forehead's tilted um, slightly forward in this picture here, but she has the, a very similar level of prognathism. And obviously, you know, the features are all drawn, but desiccation, dehydration, you know, for those of you who don't know, and I'm going to say this, it's going to sound really sarcastic, but it's almost like it needs explaining in today's day and age. Egyptian women weren't all flat chested. OK, why do I say this? Because you'll notice that Egyptian mummies, whether or not they're male or female, don't have breasts. Now, the reason why they don't have breasts is because <laughs> fat, water, sinew all of that either desiccates or dehydrates over a three thousand year period now i know what i'm saying is totally like yeah a monkey knows that why are you telling us that but i feel the need to actually express that because people think that the features <laughs> the features of a mummy reflect the features of what they look like in real life you know, it's almost as like, well, their nose never had any flesh and their lips never. And the reason they do this is because if you take a an African person and you completely dehydrate their face and you completely remove all volume all you know, water volume and all um, fat from their face, you get something that looks a little bit like a, a live European. <laughs> But that's not what they looked like when they were alive. You do realize that you will never ever, just to be clear to anyone who's on here who doesn't, who doesn't know this, you'll never find a mummy with thick lips because your lips aren't made out of bone. Now, once again, I know that I'm preaching to the choir here. It's almost sounds ridiculous that I have to explain this, but these are the depths of stupidity that you have to deal with when you're working with you know eurocentrist arab centrists who kind of want to <laughs> i mean yeah i mean the beggar's belief that i even have to say it but i do have to say it you know this is this is the thing so you're never gonna find a mummy with big breasts you're never gonna find a mummy with um a broad nose you're never gonna find a mummy with thick lips you're never gonna find mummies with any of those features because all of those features rely on water and fat and sinew and <laughs> cartilage and other things that simply do not survive the process of mummification over 3,000 years. So there you go. That's, that's now been explained. I'm hoping that we don't need to touch that again. But just looking at the position of her features, going back to Queen T, when I overlaid it with my reconstruction, they do fall in the same place. So you have that same width of the mouth, the downturn, the eyes are actually 
almost or pretty much as large as they look like on the reconstruction bus on the statue. So in my mind, if this isn't Queen T, it's someone closely related. And there is familial um, similarities between all of the Armana mummies, by the way. So all of the kind of 18th dynasty mummies, you know, from right from, you know, Queen Amos Nefertari to, to um, Queen T to... Um, Akhenaten and etc cetera, etc cetera. There, there is kind of like these familial traits that do permeate their way all the way through the 18th dynasty so a lot of the people do end up looking quite similar so I will I will admit that um I, I'm not going to go into depth about who looks exactly like who but I just I'll just say that that tends to be the case but anyway so this is Queen T and obviously the hair is something that the Eurocentrists you know jumped on with massive amounts of aplomb you know oh look at her hair it's european hair it's it's not african hair now first of all when i saw this hair i, I straight away thought to myself well what's what's not african about that it certainly is african hair and most people will be agreeing with me right now say yeah there's loads and loads of people in east africa who have loose wavy hair like this but actually i went one step further and like i said i'm going to be um standing by the arguments that i initially made i went one step further um, and I said that this is what you're seeing here is the result of a braid out. Okay. So I shared that I believe that Queen T's hair actually, when it was placed within the mummy and placed within a sarcophagus initially, it would have been in braids and those braids have been taken out. And this kind of familiar, kind of like very stiff, um, kind of, uniform patterns so you can see these hairs are kind of grouped together and they follow uniform patterns being someone who not only has daughters but is just very very familiar with how you know african hairstyles and afro hairstyles i i know a braid out when i see one and that to me was definitely an indication that this was in braids and the braids have been taken out so that's what i saw now a lot of people kind of ridiculed me a bit when i said that initially I thought this was a braid out. They just, oh, you're, you're trying too hard, mate. That's how literally people posted that. You know, you're trying too hard. It's just, just call it East African hair. I was like, yeah, I could look, I'm not going to lie. I could just say this is just East African hair because there are lots of people in East Africa and actually in West Africa and actually in different parts of Africa. There are lots of black people across Africa who have this kind of wavy hair. I know that. That's very true. Fine. But shelve that, this is a braid out. I don't actually care that Af Africans have this kind of hair I know the pattern of a braid out when I see it I know that straight away so I stand by the fact that I believe it was a braid out and now I actually believe that I have the smoking gun <laughs> so to speak and I'm going to go through a few reasons why I'm going to stand by that argument now that this was basically her hair would have been taken out of braids or taken out of a braid out so first of all let's start off with a few other queens okay so how are queens normal queens and nobility in ancient kemet normally buried well let's start off with oh by the way sorry let me just quickly give a little bit of a warning okay i'm gonna just zoom in here and zoom away from my face i'm gonna give a bit of a warning we are gonna be looking at a few mummies today and i know it can be a bit disturbing so i'm gonna give a quick early warning if you're a little bit squeamish okay and, you know, you, you don't really do well with having a look at, you know, mummies, people who have passed away. And I, and, and I also agree to a, to an extent that is, it does feel sometimes slightly disrespectful to be doing this. I actually wish that these mummies had never been dug up. But just for the sake of the research we're doing today, we are going to be looking at a few mummies. So that's just like a kind of an early warning. Um, please, can you, yeah, just just let me, you know, just let me know. All right. Um, but I know I've just say or you can leave, you know, if you find it too, a, a bit too disturbing and kind of come back later. But yes, yeah, so this is um, Queen Nodgmet that we're looking at here. And I want you to notice that her hair is braided. OK, so the mummy of Queen Nodgmet, she's found and her hair is braided fully. And you'll notice that it has this kind of sticky resin on the surface. OK, so it has this resin that's allowing the hair to keep its pattern. Um, you can have a look at Queen Nodgmet's mummy in your own time. Like I said, I'm going to try not to display them too much, but she's a, a very African queen. But I just want you to notice the hairs braided and the sticky resin upon the surface. Let's move on to the next one. So over here, we have Lady Rye. 
who is a noble, um, not necessarily a queen. But once again, I want you to take note of the hair of Lady Rai. It's in braids, as you can see. At the root, looks very similar, very, very similar to what we see with um, Queen T. Okay, so it's, you know, hair's being pulled and it's wavy at the root. It's been, had this resin applied all around it. It's got this kind of sticky resin, but it's braided all the way down. This mummy has not had the level of tampering that Queen T's mummy has had. And we're going to go actually back to that discussion in a, in a moment. But just have a look here. The hair's braided, like I said, quite clearly. Let's move on. Let's look at a couple more queens. So this is Amos Inapi. Okay, another royal dignitary. And you can see the braids once again with the resin on top. So you've got the braids and the braids have this kind of resin that's placed on top of them. Female hairs braided once again. Okay, so I hope that we're all kind of paying attention to that. Yeah, so the hair braided again. And then I'm going to move on to another queen who I did a reconstruction of very recently. Okay, this is... The great queen, Amos Nefertari, about to load up, I think. Yeah. Who wants to load? Oh, I'm too. Got to this front. There we go. Okay, cool. Uh, so there is Amos Nefertari, exactly the same again. So I'm going to try to scroll in so you'd have to look at the that too long. But you can see there, once again, look at the roots. Very, very similar. Okay, that kind of kinky roots, but very similar to what we see with Queen T. The hair is braided all the way up. Okay, you can see the resin that's been placed on the surface of the braids. Yeah. So we can see it there quite clearly. Consistent treatment of the way queens and nobility are treated in terms of when they're buried. And then we see this next one that I'm going to show you very quickly. Why is it not loading the top? Okay, I'm going to close the windows because my... Things acting a bit weird now. Close those windows, start again. Okay. This should be going to the top. There we go. And then we have another mummy here. And you can see this one's been partially braided out. So you can kind of see it's kind of in that process of being half in braids, half out. But you can see with all of the mummies that I've shown you, I hope you can see that these are all African women with African hair. Okay. When it's in braids, it's easier to see. When it's half in the braid out, it kind of starts to take on what people sometimes interpret as a European form. But it's not European hair. Okay? These are braids. They're small, tight braids. The kind of braids that you really only see in African people. So these ones have been taken out. The ones in Queen Amos Nefertari are good as gold. As you can see here, they are fully in her hair and obviously you can see in all of her statues she loved to have her hair tightly braided so i think i've kind of stretched that point so what's the where are we moving on to now in regards to this let's look at queen t let's just have a quick photo digest of how queen t liked to portray herself because you've got so many, we've got so many different portraits it's not just the bust of queen t that we have so this is one of her famous statuettes of queen t that i'm sure we've all seen Okay, there's our African queen, Queen T, no doubt about it. And you've had arguments go to and fro about whether or not Queen T's bust had darkened because of the, the colour of the wood. But this one just throws, well, that both of the busts throw that out of the window because with both busts, the eye colour, the eyeball colour is preserved. The iris colour is preserved. Okay, so you can see that if they didn't want this to be presented as the skin colour, then they could have applied some of this kind of whitish paint used for her eyes and used it for her skin, but they didn't. They clearly wanted the skin to be portrayed in chocolate brown. Her hair is darker black. So this is a very deliberate colouring we see here. This is not just a, a brown block of wood being used here. This is a deliberately coloured, you know, darkened and varnished. And just to prove that this has been varnished, as you can see on the arm, where the varnish is not applied and the true wood colour is shown through. So clearly here, this is a beautiful portrait of Queen T. And I want you to have a look at her hair in this statuette. Okay, very, very clearly braided from head to toe. Let's go to another 
statuette of Queen T. So we can see if this is consistent usage or not. So here's another very famous little jade statue of Queen T once again. And you can see the thick braids that are used throughout her head. Or at least this, these ones look more like twists, I would say. Maybe some kind of like knotted twists, I'm not sure. But either which way, there's, you know, that kind of long, that lengthy hairstyle where her hair is being treated in that manner. Okay. And here's another one that I actually just came across very, very recently. So I'm just going to, okay, it's not going to let me load up. Let me see if it, okay, let's do it this way. That's easier. So here's another one. Once again, you can see the way her hair's being treated here. Okay, in this beautiful statue, she has the crown on, the feathered crown, but beneath the crown, you can see this is where her hair kind of shows through at the bottom. I believe that to be a representation of braids. Once again, it could be twists. I'm not sure they haven't been that detailed with the pattern down there, or at least not as detailed as they have been with, with this one. So it's kind of difficult to see. But either which way we can see, there's definitely a consistent treatment of the way Queen T kind of looks and the way she used to style her hair okay so in fact do i have any more let me see if i've got any more i've got this one as well another bust of queen t here her nose has kind of been knocked off on this one but we can see here once again the hair this time it's kind of in kind of a short twist towards the head this is one hairstyle, actually, admittedly, that I've seen a lot. I think Mary Tartan uses this hairstyle. Um, and another sister of King Tart is um, shown in this hairstyle. And it lengthens to the back. So I'm. it's probably one of the only hairstyles that I've seen in ancient Kemet that I'm not 100% sure what it's a representation of. Okay, it's probably one of the only ones that I'm... Normally, I see ancient Egyptian, ancient Kemetic hairstyles and I know exactly what African hairstyle that corresponds to. This one looks like one from the top here, but as it lengthens to the back, I mean, it's a beautiful hairstyle. There's no two ways about it. It's a lovely hairstyle, um, but I'm not going to act like I know exactly what this hairstyle is a depiction of. Um, it's, we know it's an African hairstyle. We just don't know exactly how it's applied. Was it... Yeah, anyway, if you've got any kind of like feedback on to, on how that kind of hairstyle is achieved feel free to send me a comment or a link you know i'll gladly look into it but anyway so that's part one of our video right now because we've gone through the hairstyles we've gone through the fact that egyptian mummies or ancient kemetic mummies were always buried with braids in their hair and we've also covered the fact that queen t did not have braids in their hair now, what is the reason she didn't have braids in her hair? Let's have a quick look into that because there is a reason why she didn't have braids in her hair. Um, thank you very much. Um, what's the name? Dealing the Real. That's a great name. It says, please, please address the claim that these hairstyle depictions in these statues are wigs. I mean, we can. But we don't have to because we've just seen the mummies and many, many of the mummies were just, you know, buried with um, braids. So we can see it right there. Um, I've got an actual full video or at least a short actually on African hairstyles and the most common one being the short twist in ancient Kemet. Um, and, the fact that, and the fact is that they talk about ancient Egyptians only ever having nubian wigs so even if they were wigs if all of their wigs which we know they ain't by the way but if all of their wigs are styled after nubian hairstyles it's very very clear who they depict themselves as and who they saw themselves as culturally okay it's quite clear you know so wigs not wigs we know they're not wigs because they only found about a handful of wigs ever <laughs> most of the people were buried you know with their natural hair you know and most of the hairstyles that you see of people in villages were people with their natural hair. Um, it's just an exaggeration. Once again, I wouldn't say it didn't occur ever, but probably didn't occur any more common than we see wigs in today's society. It was just another kind of cultural thing where some people would do it. Probably very few would do it. Most people would have their natural hair. 
Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that donation. So where was I? Yes, so I was going to come on to the let's discuss Queen T a little bit because a lot of people don't realise why she was in the state that she was in. So I'm just going to quickly pull up an excerpt so that we can go through this together. So just bear with me. I think I've got it here. No, 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 don't have it there. Here it is. Okay, so for those of you who are unaware, Queen T was found and her mummy was in a terrible state. Essentially... It had been um, her tomb or the tomb that she was in had been kind of ransacked by tomb raiders. And I'm just going to read for you really quickly so you kind of have an understanding. So those who had left the mummy. So the mummy of Queen T is known as KV35 elderly lady. Um, KV35 is the tomb that she was found in. So Kings Valley 35 and EL just stands for elderly lady. There was also KV35 younger lady, which they've umdenard about whether or not it's Nefertiti. Um, they believe it to be the mother of King Tutankhamun, but they don't know if it's Queen Nefertiti or not. But let's have a look here. So, so those who had left the mummy in KV35 had made no attempt to rewrap it or place it in a coffin. And none of the early, sorry, and none of the mostly broken grave goods found in KV35 seem to be associated with the mummy. So one of the things about when they found the mummy of um, who they now claim to be Queen T, this KV35 elderly lady, the reason they couldn't identify her is because she wasn't in a coffin. She didn't have a cartouche attached to her. And so they were essentially playing a lot of guesswork. And there was a lot of guesswork done. They found, allegedly found a sample of her hair inside a coffin that was um, inside um, King Tutankhamun's grave. I don't know how much I believe that story. Um, it sounds like Eurocentric nonsense to me because it's something that didn't seem to ever occur ever again <laughs> in ancient Kemet. So I was very dubious about that story when I heard about it. Um, but the reason I bring this up to you is because you have to understand how mistreated this particular mummy was she was left outside and this is where i believe the braid out in the hair may have occurred it may have just started with the ends loosening but with the way that the mummy had literally just been flung around this is how we ended up and i wouldn't be surprised by the way if it was given some assistance <laughs> by egyptologists who realized that the hair takes on a wavy texture when it's taken out of the braids i wouldn't be surprised at all but it's important for us to understand this. And why is this important? It's important for two reasons. The first reason is the color of the hair shows, clearly shows the kind of destabilization that black hair shows when it's been exposed to the elements. You and I all know who have dark hair. When it's exposed to the elements, it will turn brown. It will start to lighten over time. It's very, very normal that that will occur. And bear with me one moment. I'm just going to do a little bit of cleaning up here. Let's uh, see if I can do this. Boom. Okay, sorry. So I've just um, upgraded one of my patrons to moderator i promised i would so fireflare if you're online you now have the power <laughs> if there's anything going on there because i have had a chance to look at the comments for a little while all right so i was talking about the fact that the hair and the mummy had just literally been exposed to the elements this could have been for hundreds of years okay um and this is what would have caused the hair to lighten from maybe jet black which maybe have been the original color to a lighter shade of brown which is what you see it as that's you know it it takes an african person one day in the sun to go out with the wrong products on your hair or maybe or something like that and you could come in with brown hair that literally is not uncommon at all so it's very very um in, important that we understand that sorry i didn't mean to highlight that comment um I, I was just trying to upgrade him all right cool so that's kind of that covered now let's talk about hair by the way guys are you still with me i've got 200 online uh let me know that you're still with me because uh, i know i've been rambling on for a little bit and there's a lot that i want to cover in today's video so we've looked at queen t we've looked at the, you know the, the way her mum is treated and you can look at this um in more detail it talks there's actually lots of articles out there that tell you about the state that queen t's mummy was in when it was found but i think it was just kind of just want to highlight that, that to you before i kind of move on 
So we've covered that topic. Now, let's talk about hair. Because I think understanding African hair is one of the most important things. And I thought I knew everything there was to know about African hair. But I don't know if anybody who's online right now has heard about Chebe powder that's been used, that's used in Africa. Okay? So Chebe powder is something that's used in Africa. And when I saw this video, it was like a eureka moment to me. Because... I think we all have our kind of preconceptions about what's achievable in terms of African phenotypes, African hair. We all have got our stereotypes and we see a certain standard or a certain waviness of hair. And we think it applies maybe to one culture and doesn't apply to another. We might have our different viewpoints. But actually, this process of Chebe powder that's used in Chad. So by the way, but this is Chad and Chad is... Not East Africa, Chad is Central Africa, it's the Sahel. Um, I would say it's almost Central West Africa, West, sorry, Central West Africa. It borders Niger, okay, so it's very near to, um, it's obviously along the Niger, um, the Niger Valley, and these are obviously Central West African people, and they have a process um, which uses Chebe powder that I believe actually is an ancient i believe this dates back to ancient egypt I'm not saying it was created in ancient egypt i believe it was a once again a cultural continuity perhaps a nilo saharan cultural continuity that was shared across the sahel and down the sahara and down the um, nile valley i believe that this is something that's a, a shared culture and i'm going to talk about a few different shared cultures but the chebe powder and, uh, and there's a few people who are popping up who are aware of it basically gives people with very kinky hair so if you just look at this pause frame at the moment you can see this woman who I'm, who I'm floating over very long hair you know we're talking you know hip length hair here and you can see the the natural texture of her relatives behind they're not they haven't got the loosest natural hair this would be quite tightly curled quite tightly coiled hair this is very much you know just nor you know i would say you know normal kind of central in some tribes i have to say you have to be careful saying this because some tribes have it sometimes don't but this is kind of like normal i can't remember what c number it would be 6c 4c someone help me out in the comment but this is just like you know very kinky hair and yet you see we're achieving this length and we've got this texture that would normally attribute to horn africans or would normally attribute to perhaps people who have got you know people who are you know maybe like sudanese i know many many sudanese people with hair like this but and yet it's being achieved right there in central west africa just by following this very simple process so i'm not going to talk too much i'm going to just let actually let this video play um let me know if we get the audio and i might skip skip a skip a few bits by the way as well but i'm going to let this video play so you can kind of all see it because it was fascinating for me and i found it incredibly interesting so 4C, thank you for correcting me there. 4C here. Just gonna make sure the audio's on. Wait. Just popping the audio up. Called the Basara Arabs. The defining feature of this ethnicity is their long, frizzy hair, which often reaches their thighs. You should be able to hear it now. They agreed to share their beauty secrets with me, so I went to find out how they make their hair grow so long and the recipe for their hair treatments. They coat their hair with a mix of ingredients which keeps their hair extremely hydrated and moist. This stops it from breaking from childhood, right? Now I just want you to just have a look at the texture of that hair there. Have a look at the texture of the hair. This is, there's no relax, relaxer that's been used here, no modern artificial processes. But how different is that texture from the texture that you see with Queen T? and the braid out like I actually expressed before. You can see when African hair is braided, like I've expressed, and it's taken out, it follows these very uniform patterns. So these waves all follow each other. It's not kind of random waves for each strand. They've been held in a similar pattern for a long time. And as a result of being held in that form, they take on very uniform patterns, which is why I was able to identify that looked like a braid out. But let me let the video continue playing. Right through until they were adults. So 
this then starts to. Let me just so this now is going to start to talk a bit about the, the process of making the chebe powder. We're not going to go through it all, but I'm just going to just share a few scenes with you here. So I'm just going to skip forward a bit and let you see a bit more of the video again. <laughs> So you see it's heated there. I'm just going to skip it forward a bit here. So you can see them using, I know they use a lot of different ingredients there. This isn't a Chebe powder uh, kind of workshop. So just forgive me for <laughs> skipping forward here. You can see the use of cloves. I actually eat cloves daily. Um, I wanted to show you the next part. Now, this part here, I wanted to show you so you can see them using this kind of like, kind of classic, I would say, um, African kind of grinder. Now, why have I stopped it here? Well, let's have a look here because we always do like to touch on cultural continuity when we see it between existing African cultures and ancient cultures. So let's have a look and see if we've got any cultural continuity here. So if we look here, I've just got to pop that on the screen. Well, looky, looky, what do we have here? Exactly the same process being used in these ancient Kemetic statuettes. Exactly the same process. Let's have a look. If, you, if that one's not convincing enough for you, let's have a look here. Now, I'm not saying that they were grinding Chebe powder, but once again, just kind of sharing those cultural continuities that still exist that could virtually be a freeze frame of exactly what I'm showing you here. <laughs> it can literally be a freeze frame of exactly what I'm showing you. Let me just go and minimize that. Exactly the same process being used there to grind powders, okay? So you can see that cultural continuity still exists between Africa and the ancient Kemetic cultures. You can see it there plain as day being you you know the 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 process of grinding powders using this but i just thought i'd show you that really quickly let's continue and then i just want to show you the application so let's go let's, i'm just going to skip ahead now and we're going to go move on to the application So you could see there, I'm just going to quickly zoom back quickly. Just ha If you have a look when the hair's just tied up here, you can see it has that same, and I'll show you another video where it's a bit clearer, but it has that same kind of glossy resin look that I showed you with the queens when they have their hair braided when they're, being, when they're mummified. So you can see basically what we're seeing here is almost exactly the same process. You're seeing Africans with, you know, 4C, 3C hair, you know, the, the kind of the tightest style of kind of curly hair that you can find in Africa with the ability to grow very straight hair, very wavy hair, very long hair just by using these processes. Remember, this is all about creating length. Okay, this is all about creating length and it's not uncommon if hair is treated um, enough in this style. And actually there's, there's, I could actually just quickly show you very quickly in the article, you know, Queen T was actually known for her hair care regime. Um, strangely enough, Zawi Hawastia, <laughs> you know, <laughs> hate to say his name, don't we? But he spoke about the fact that, you know, there. Um, th she had a hair care regime that was probably second to none in ancient Kemet. So you can imagine her treating herself to a process like this over and over again just to s essentially achieve this length. And another thing that I want to show you as well, I'd, I don't know if this is a result of traction, but if you look at this woman's forehead, I don't know if it's a result of traction or actually a stylistic thing, but Queen T was known to have the same... Um, was known to have the same kind of approach when it came to her hair, where they said the just the, the front portion of her hair was shaved. So I don't know if that's a result of kind of 
you know, they call it traction alopecia when it's kind of like you've had the pulling of the front of the hair or if this is a de deliberate stylistic thing. I don't know enough about this video, but I do know the kind of cultural continuities that we're seeing between what's happening here in Chad with these African women and the way Queen T's hair looks. So I'm just going to quickly play it quickly so you can see the, the texture when it's pulled out of the braid and tell me for yourself if that looks familiar. So you can see the braids being taken out. So have a look there, the braids, the braids being taken out and have a look at the texture of the hair. And just in case you've forgotten, let's have another quick flash at Queen T's mummy, just in case anyone's forgotten. Now, does anyone want to tell me that you see any degree of difference? <laughs> I was going to say a great degree of difference, but does anyone want to tell me that you see a large amount of difference between what's being exhibited here with Queen T's hair and what you can see in the video with this braid out Before and the Chebe mixture, powder process? She wets the hair. Then she applies Because I couldn't. I, I, for me personally, that looks almost identical. That looks almost identical. Um, and that would be a, you know, a very plausible explanation um, as to why Queen T's hair looks the way it does. It's just simply another African cultural process to treat and to lengthen the growth of hair. Very, very simple. Okay. Um... Let me just quickly show you a couple more videos because we've got a couple more that are very similar to this. So I'm just going to quickly come out of full screen mode. I'm going to show you another one. Let me know if you're still with me, by the way. Sudaniyat, and I'm one of them. I use the karkar, like our mothers and our babies. Also, they use the karkar. Oh, by the way, um, it's worse. It says Sudanese secret. So I'm going to assume that she's speaking. Arabic, but if you know what language she's speaking, do let me know. I'm assuming it's Arabic because it says Sudanese, but I could be incorrect here. Now, I'm not sure actually, if this is actually, I think this process is slightly different. So this process here is not Chebe powder, I think. This is a, a more butter approach, but please feel free to kind of jump in and correct me. I'm sure someone in the comments will know. But once again, the outcomes are very, very similar. So once again, she's going to show the... And by the way, if you want to kind of subscribe to some of these channels that I show you to support them, please do. You know, why not? I'm stealing content for them. So it's only nice that we return them with a few subscriptions. Uh, she doesn't need them. She's got 287 subs. But yeah, let's uh, quickly skip ahead because she show. Actually, let's have a look because she shows you how she makes it. And here's the ingredients. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah, so this is a... Is it a slightly, it looks like a slightly different ingredients list here. Cloves, malep, cow fat, beeswax, peanut oil, sesame oil, and orange peel. If anyone knows this um, ingredients or list of ingredients and what it makes or has any information about exactly what these things are called, please do let the rest of us know. But once again, I just want to show the process. <laughs> so she's going to show how she makes it. She's going to show how she makes it. I'm going to skip over that if that's okay. And I'm just going to quickly get to the point of application. Because it's very interesting, but I'm sure if there's anyone out there who wants to copy the process, I'm going to have to leave you to it. So I'm going to just skip ahead to here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so I just want you to note the texture of the hair before application. Once again, she's been doing this process for a little while, but the, the texture of the hair, once again, is just very standard African texture okay it's not particularly really super loose or anything like that it's not particularly wavy i'm not saying that africans can't have really wavy hair but this is one of the reasons why i stopped short when we looked at the mummy of queen t of saying oh well you know it, that's just their hair it was just long and kind of wavy i was like no my belief actually is that her hair would have been closer to the texture that you see here 
prior to the application of the the resins and whatever process was used to put the braids in that's kind of what my personal belief is video وهو كيف نستخدم زيت الكركار او اصح طريقه لاستخدام زيت الكركار على شعرنا اول واهم خطوه هي ترطيب الشعر نبلل شعرنا بحبه مويه ونضيف كريم ترطيب او شعرك النقطه دي مهمه جدا بعد ده نمسح حبه زيت كده على شعرنا ونجي نعمل اي ستايل حمايه مشاط اللي هي الضفاير هيحبس الجفاف حتى امهاتنا so زمان وحبباتنا here, كانوا شويه بيستخدموا you can see the, the, the compound is applied really heavily and thick you can see it's kind of almost creates a coating on top and bear in mind this does contain beeswax so I'd imagine this dries quite firm so this is going to give you very similar to what we saw when we looked at the mummies of the queens with the kind of that layer that sits on top of the braid itself you can see this is this is almost an identical I mean it looks almost identical if I just quickly bear with me sorry once again squeamish morning if you are squeamish you might <laughs> you might want to just kind of look away but I just want to just do a quick zoom in to Queen Nojmet's hair quickly if it loads up will it load up it's really playing up sorry that's really annoying I don't know why it's doing that okay so Queen Nojmet's hair I just want to kind of zoom in here you can see that same kind of resiny surface okay you can see it there it's the same process. I mean, Queen Nojme, if you have a look at her, she just looks like a very standard kind of um, African woman. But you can see there the hair, even at the top, is almost like glue here, the way it's just been, you know, it sits on top of her head. But you can imagine that, obviously, she's been mummified and this her entire head used to be wrapped in, you know, resined, resin bandages. So you can imagine the, you know, w w the kind of compression that caused, uh, you know, with the hair that you can see that sits on top of her scalp. But... Just want to kind of like highlight that once again. I'll let the video play out. تخنوا محبة موية يرطبوا شعرهم قبل ما يستخدموا الكركار. فحنرطب أول حتى بعد نستخدم دهن الكركار. ودي طريقة ال LCO وأنا شرحتها بشكل مفصل في قناتي في فيديو كامل في ريت تشوفوا. ويا ريت يا جماعة لو حبيتوا فيديو اليوم ما تنسوا تشيروا لأكبر عدد من الناس عشان الكل يستفيد ولأنه الكركار ما وصفة للشعر وبس الكركار so كنزنا وإرثنا ومطلوب مننا أن نحن نحافظ عليه ونورثه لأولادنا ولأحفادنا إن شاء الله Now that process that I just showed you there doesn't look as kind of um stretchy <laughs> for want of a better word as the chebe powder process which seems um a little bit more heavy in terms of the way it pulls but still very very similar outcome so i want to show you that one i'm just going to show you one more now this is a short and a different see person resin and spices powder. and it will leave your hair feeling super soft and nourished. so look how thickly that's applied there can you see how thick that's being applied here are three ancient beauty secrets from Africa on. you should definitely try for super hydrated hair try chebe powder so you can always see it's also almost being painted on and it's that process that basically allows them to you know get huge amounts of length that probably they wouldn't have been able to get before that I'm trying to think of that this four is there a fourth video I feel like there's only three let me see what this one is هاي بنات اليوم حوريكم افضل واصح طريقه تعملوا فيها ماسك السدر لشعركم صدقوني هذه الطريقه الوحيده اللي حتحتاجوها Yeah I think this is similar to one I've already showed you yeah, this has already been shown that's brilliant so that's all the videos I did want to just share that kind of chebe powder process with you guys so that you're all kind of aware of that so let's have a look of where we are at the moment okay have a bit of a digest of what we've covered so far we've covered the fact that we have Queen T. We know that she has her hair constantly in braids throughout her life. We obviously know how Queen T obviously preferred to portray herself as well. <laughs> and we have Queen T's mummy causing a degree of controversy, not to people who have any common sense, but to, but because, you know, it has a wavy kind of patterning and a wavy texture to it. You have these accusations or at least these kind of suggestions that she might be European. But we're now aware of the fact that if you look at the hair there, you can almost see 
the separate braids there. I can see a braid there. I can see a braid there. You can see where the braids follow to provide this kind of wavy texture, which has given Queen T this kind of wavy hair look. Now, once the hair's kind of been pulled out of braids that perhaps has been in for several thousands of years, don't, and there's been some kind of resin or chebe powder perhaps a pro, um, process applied to it, it's not going to suddenly jump back and regain its kink okay it's going to <laughs> maintain and stay exactly where it is so that really does explain exactly how queen t's hair got the way it did we also covered in quite a bit of detail the coloring of queen t's hair because we in fact let me just show you a more recent picture so this one's actually quite important actually because this is another thing that we're going to cover as well because I, I actually believe that They've shaved Queen T's scalp a bit. If you notice, I show you this picture. You can see her hair comes relatively far up her hairline. But if you look at the latest images of Queen T, they look like this. And the hair's pulled back quite considerably. You can actually see even where the coloration change. Where I believe her hair would have been covering her scalp here. But now there's kind of like it's been pulled back. So what's caused that? What's caused that? My belief is that they've shaved the scalp of Queen T to get rid of the kinky roots. Now, that sounds like a huge conspiracy theory, and it would be, other than the fact that it's not something, it's something that they've definitely done before. So we've had mummies that were exhumed with, you know, kinky stubble, and then they're shaved so they're completely bald. This is not unheard of and not on. So I actually believe that this is what happened with Queen T so that we have kind of like it's once again, it's this illusion thing. So I spoke to spoke to you guys about this in the last live stream. The fact that if you get a alabaster statue and you repaint the black parts of the statue, like the eyeliner, it makes it then look like the alabaster was the aim. I, I, you're trying to make the skin color look cream. It's a very ridiculous, you know, ploy that Egyptologists use. Well, this is another one, which is shaving the scalp of mummies when they have kink and just kind of like allowing that textured hair to show at the ends. Now, conspiracy theories aside, because in fairness, I cannot prove that other than just by looking at old photo versus new photo and that to many people won't be what doesn't provide proof they could say there's a million reasons why they could have just combed it back or could have fallen back or could have fallen out and that's fair enough but let's have a look once again at the hair which i've said quite con con conclusively resembles a braid out you can see it best from this side where you kind of see the edges are quite you know quite clearly show resin on certain parts which suggests that certain parts were exposed to you know were exposed to the outside of the braid and certain parts were exposed to the inside of the braid once again if you have familiar familiarity with african hair this will be easier for you to see than perhaps if you don't um thank you very much nerd large i'm just going to quickly pop your comment on the screen the hair textures of ancient egypt is where the they weren't black types can't play off I watched a 2022 documentary about Queen T recently and they had a white Arab in a cheap braided wig portraying her. Keep it up. Thank you very much. And this is the thing. Just balancing all the arguments, obviously not getting drawn in too much about the blackness of Queen T because I don't think, I try not to have to make that argument anymore. I think common sense tells you, you know, what these people were. But more importantly than that, it's the arguments that people rely upon that show you how desperate they are. Because we have Queen T who portrays herself in all of her statues as an African woman, wears African hairstyles, is clearly an African queen, has an African mummy apart from the fact the only thing that you could actually draw for is the fact that her hair slightly resembles the kind of wavy format of a modern kind of Eurasian but it doesn't disqualify the fact that this hair is very common in Africa so it doesn't you can't just say because we also have hair like this outside of Africa that the woman wasn't African especially when all of the other qualifying factors 
she suggests that she plainly was an African. So this is the, you know, this is the ridiculous kind of arguments that they settle upon. It's like they find one, one little thing and they jump on it with so much fervor and just completely disregard everything else. Just completely disregard the fact that she has, you know, super tropical African limb proportions. Let's completely disregard that her autosomal DNA has already been tested and came back very African. <laughs> you know, I think in her case, she was one of, she was one of the, the least African in terms of autosomal results of the Armana. She was only five times more African than she was <laughs> than she was Levantine, whereas all the rest were like 20 times more African. But either which way, they were all just ridiculously African. Ridiculously African. So even, you know, it's, 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 it's hilarious what they kind of will stretch to. Even Ramesses' DNA, even Ramesses' DNA was ridiculously African. This is the kind of like, the one they try and tell you is blonde. And I've actually got more research on that. I don't know if we're gonna, yeah, let's, let's cover that actually today because we're, we're on a bit of a roll. We're, we're an hour in and I feel like there's, there's a few more things that I'd like to cover because I have done a, a, fair, a fair bit of research that I'd like to kind of share with you guys today. Stuff that some of you may have heard before, but for some of you, it might be new. So it's definitely worth covering anyway. So we've covered Queen T quite a bit now. Let's talk about hair color in general. Okay, let's talk about hair color in general. Now, one of the things that you'll hear quite a lot is the i mean i love that comment um black and travel history says they were super africans now to a lot of people that's going to sound like a ridiculous statement what do you mean super africans well the research suggests that they have quote unquote and i don't even like the word negroid but they have super negroid limb proportions okay that's the en entire armana and several other you know ancient Egyptian dynasties, super negroid limb proportions. That's, you know, so black they're off the scale, <laughs> essentially. We didn't make up that term. Afrocentrists didn't make up that term. That's research that they have that's available. And yet it rarely ever makes the light of day or rarely ever gets brought up. It just gets ignored because it, all they need to do is find one little thing that coincides with Europeans or kind of like something that they share and they'll jump on it like a rash, you know? So you could be 100% African, but maybe you carry a marker that a few Europeans carry. They'll call that the European marker and say, oh, they were definitely Europeans now. King Tut was, was Scottish, <laughs> you know? Forget King Tut's 400 statues. Anyway, sorry, I'm ranted. So um, let's... let's um. Let's get back to topic because there does a few things I want to talk about. All right, bear with me. In fact, I'm going to go through some of these comments while I'm trying to find my feet because I've got a few things I want to cover and I want to make sure that I haven't missed any things. So just bear with me for one moment. Okay, cover that. Da, 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 da. We're doing really well, actually. So we've covered the hair of the mummies as well which is fantastic we covered the fact that they all had braided hair and queen tees was mysteriously not in braids yet her pattern resembled braiding so we've done quite well there i want to cover color of hair here um kelnari thank you so much for the um donation i really really appreciate it i'm going to pop it on the screen in a moment but i'm going to give nerd larger a little bit more time on the screen because <laughs> Twenty dollar donations was very generous, so I'm gonna pop you on the screen, but just bear bear a moment. I just want to let a large one have a, have a bit more time there. So um, let's um, talk about hair color because actually this is actually a very interesting topic because it's got so many layers. Now the first thing we'll talk about is henna. I'm sure all of you guys have heard about the fact that in fact let's let's just do something that's quite fun. All right, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pull up. Um, the mummy, once again, if you if you have if you've got a bit of a weak stomach, just bear with me. I'm so really sorry. Because we are gonna look at a couple of mummies today. But I want to look at the mummy of Ramesses. Yeah, cool. There we go. I say mummy of Ramesses and it pulls up to you. That's interesting. Okay. So this is a fake, by the way. <laughs> 
<laughs> they love to pull up these fake images. So let's talk about the the, the mummy of Ramesses. I'm going to pull up the one that's been least photoshopped, which is so difficult. Look at this one where they've actually decolorized it to try and make him look peach. I mean, these people are desperate and stupid, aren't they? Okay, so I'm going to pull up this one just because it's, it's the least photoshopped. In fact, here we go. Here's a better one. Here we go. That's uh, Can you imagine the, the, the pathology of people who will take a mummy that looks like this and actually used to be a lot darker according to Sheikh Antidi but obviously it blasted it with radiation but take a mummy that looks like this photoshop it and turn the skin cream like what's wrong with people what really is wrong with people I mean if you're a Eurocentrist out there and that's the kind of tricks that you pull or your tricks that you need to pull in order to make yourself feel better I really really do pity you really genuinely pity you but anyway um, let me just quickly pull up Kanari's comment. There we go, super. And the comment says, my sister's hair looks the same when she removes her braids. Thank you, I thought I was going mad there. <laughs> she also uses pomade to keep her hair from pulling backward um, into, the wave, into the wave curl. Exactly. It's not a stretch. Once again, it's just sometimes you just have to have exposure to different kind of African cultural norms to see things and be able to say, I know what I'm seeing there. So that's why it's very easy for me to say, I know what I'm seeing there. That's not, Africans do have wavy hair, but that's not naturally wavy hair. That's a braid out. It's the same thing when I look at the hair of Ramesses, actually, whilst we're on the point, people are like, oh, well, Ramesses has got straight ginger hair. It's like Ramesses' hair is clearly looks like it's been compressed. You know, we're talking about 3,000 years of compression, guys. 3,000 years of hair compression, okay, underneath, you know, resin combed through the scalp. But anyway, let's talk about the color of Ramesses' hair because we're not going to talk about texture. We'll come, we'll come on to the texture later. So this is a, the mummy of Ramesses and M Ramesses is known for having ginger hair. Now, the ginger hair is created by henna. So they say that he has henna in his hair and that's what turned his hair red because we know that Ramesses was in his 90s. I believe the age 92. He, he lived a ripe old age, Ramesses. Um, Carol, thank you so much for the donation. Um, you are amazing and I appreciate it so much. Um, Ramesses' hair um, had was ginger. So they make a massive deal about, oh, he was a redhead, he was a redhead. Um, but then obviously they've, um, they know he was 92. So they know that he probably didn't have any hair color other than hair that was artificial. But then apparently they did tests and they found out that he has his hair was naturally red. Okay? So this is this is the apparent then the, he apparently had naturally red hair if you check the scalp. Now we're going to dive into that a bit. So do bear with me because we're gonna dive into that claim that Ramesses hair was naturally red. And we're actually gonna look at a few different things. First of all, we're going to have a, a very, very quick and basic exploration into pheomelanin and eumelanin. Now, pheomelanin and eumelanin are the two types of melanin that make up pigmentation in humans. So it's not just in the hair. We have it in the hair, but we also have pheomelanin and eumelanin in the skin. Now, um, which one should we jump on first? Sorry, I've got a few articles kind of prepared. Let's start, actually, let's start off with this one because this is quite light. Where's it gone? Uh, this one here. Boom. Let's start off with this one because this one's quite light but also gives us the visual that we love. Okay, so eumelanin is the darker pigmentation. So if you have brown or black hair, brown or black hair, then essentially your eumelanin is, is dominant. You've got enough eumelanin obviously the, the most eumelanin gives you the darkest pigment of hair and it gets lighter and lighter interesting fact actually to consider and this is where it all gets a little bit kind of like well how does it, how exactly does it work africans do not have the darkest hair pigment asians have the darkest hair pigment particularly far east asians they have almost jet black hair pigment most africans have dark brown hair Okay, so most Africans have dark brown hair. It's actually very rare to find jet black hair in Africa. So most Africans have a very dark shade of brown. If you're looking for kind of like very black hair, almost coal black, you have to go to Far East Asia normally. It's very rare that black people have that level of pigmentation in the hair. But either which way, eumelanin gives you the dark pigments, that is black and brown. Pheomelanin gives you the... Um, 
lighter pigments, i.e. red and blonde hair. Now, here's where it gets quite interesting. Okay. Everybody has both eumelanin and theomelanin. Okay. And that's how the entire peroxide industry works. When your diet, will say when you're bleaching your hair, you'll tend to go through these processes. So if you've got black hair and you bleach it, it will get lighter, it will turn red. And then eventually, once all of the eumelanin or most of the eumelanin is stretched out, stripped out, it will turn blonde and eventually it will turn white. Okay. That's how it works. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. I'm just going to quickly, I can't zoom in here, so I'm just going to read out this highlighted part and I hope you can follow along. It says, Theomelanin is more biochemically stable than black eumelanin. So the melanin that makes up, or the theomelanin that makes up the red and the blonde pigment in your hair is more stable, more chemically stable than the black eumelanin. What does this essentially mean? So it says, but less biochemically stable than the brown. What does this essentially mean? If you've got black hair, okay, and the eumelanin breaks down for one reason or another, i.e. the introduction of peroxide, or perhaps 3,000 years of mummification in some unknown resins, your eumelanin might break down, but your theomelanin might be preserved. And that would ultimately result in your hair turning a shade of blonde or a shade of ginger or red. That's the natural chemical process because being dominant, i.e. remember you have recessive and dominant. Dominant means you have it all. So Africans are genetically dominant in that factor. They come with the full spectrum and you remove from in order to get the different stages of kind of you know melanin what's the word i'm looking for i, I, I want to say deficiency without being rude less melanin let's just say less melanin <laughs> you have the you know you have the stages of less melanin as a result of the melanin being stripped away so is it possible that a mummy that's been within a you know sarcophagus with you know unknown resin compounds combed through their hair before they were wrapped up is it possible that that would cause some kind of eumelanin destabilization resulting in red hair well yes it's definitely quite possible but let's go one step further so we, we're aware now of eumelanin and theomelanin that's only level one let's kick on to level two because this gets quite deep okay it says here, unlike eumelanin, epidermal theomelanin also showed little relationship to induced tannin. Okay, so I want you to bear with this, yeah? Follow along. Eumelanin, unlike eumelanin, epidermal theomelanin. So if you're, um, if you haven't got um, epidermal eumelanin and you only have epidermal, epidermal theomelanin, i.e. you're a natural redhead, okay? I, you know, you've got the <laughs> red hair and you've got the pale skin. That means you haven't got the eumelanin in your skin. Showed little relationship to induced tannin. The present findings could be particularly significant in the view of recent suggestions that theomelanin, rather than protecting the skin against UV radiation, may actually contribute to UV-induced skin damage. So, obviously we know this. But this is the science behind essentially melanoma, okay? When you haven't got sufficient amounts of melanin or the right type of melanin to protect your skin against UV radiation or against sun rays, okay? It will contribute the actual fear melanin, the thing that's making your hair naturally red and gives you that kind of very pale skin, is actually going to contribute to UV-induced skin damage. Okay, so you have to bear that in mind. So when people are claiming that, oh, well, Ramesses was a natural redhead. And I'm not saying that you can't get African people with naturally red hair because we know that they do exist as well. But we're not talking about that. I don't believe Ramesses was one of them, by the way. I believe Ramesses had black hair and we'll come on to that. But when you get, you know what you Europeans are suggesting when they say Ramesses is a natural redhead? They're trying to assert, insist that he was some kind of a ginger in the middle of in the middle of Africa, with all of the 
deficiencies that come along with being theomelanin dominant, where it clearly says here that essentially he would have caught melanoma out in African sun. The science is here for us to see that. So that's now kind of two strikes against the possibility or the probability that Ramesses was a natural redhead. But we're not done there. Let's move on to the henna discussion because we keep hearing this henna discussion, the fact that Ramesses dyed his hair red so his hair would look like it looked like in his youth because he was a redhead. Yeah, he was a ginger. Ramesses was a ginger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, one moment. I just want to highlight that comment. Thank you, Carol. You rock. Appreciate it. Please do, when you do um, leave donations, leave a comment because I do want to kind of like highlight you on the screen. In fact, I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause there. I've been talking for a bit and I feel like I need to kind of go through some of the comments. So we're going to have a quick hiatus here. Well, I'm going to go through some of these comments. I'm going to try and address some of them because we've had loads. It has been pretty action packed. Oh, gosh, where do I start? OK, I'm going to start from where the comments are now, actually. So um, there are blacks with natural red hedges. I spoke about that. I don't believe Ramesses is one of them. OK, I don't believe Ramesses is one of them. And it's, it, once again, it's the same argument that I made when I spoke about uh, Queen T's hair. I know there's black people or Africans with naturally very loose and wavy hair, but I don't believe Queen T is one of them. I believe her hair is the result of a braid out. And I believe I've kind of shown that now. And I don't believe Ramesses' hair is a natural red head and we'll come on to that. Has Ramesses ever been painted with red or blonde hair? Mic drop. <laughs> You know, <laughs> simple. Has he ever been painted with red and blonde hair? If you're going to claim he was a redhead, show us the proof. Don't do your little pseudoscience and pull up a mummy that's been buried for 3,000 years that you've blasted with radiation for the past 100 years and then tell us, you know, he was a natural redhead because we found, we looked at the roots of his hair. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. Show us the proof. Show us the statues of Ramesses looking like a natural redhead because we all know what Ramesses statues look like. If you don't know what Ramesses look like, by the way, look at Abu Simbel. Okay? <laughs> look at that Abu Simbel. Look at the statues, the, the colossal statues of Abu Simbel and tell me if that's not an African man. Let's go. Let's carry on going through. So, Zoltar said most Nehesi or Southerners, Nubians, wore henna with yellow or red hair maybe so but once again i don't think that was the goal either we're going to come on to this i don't think red a red tint was the goal and i think a few of you know why where i'm going with this already black people can have red hair absolutely can i say that i didn't disagree with that i hope that's not what's coming off this i'm not saying that it's not possible for black people to have red hair but just because it's possible and they can, it doesn't mean I'm going to rest on that argument because they've given me some flimsy argument about Ramesses having red hair, naturally red hair. I don't believe it and I don't believe it to be the case. I don't believe it's backed up by any evidence. I don't think Ramesses' hair was red. I think it was black. Um, and I think they're trying to sell you one of their untruths, which they do quite often. Um, you know, it's when it comes to Eurocentrists, they're like the news. <laughs> What do I mean when I say Eurocentrists are like the news? They repeat stuff over and over again till it starts sounding normal. You know, when you first hear stuff reported in the news, you're like, oh, what is this rubbish? I don't watch the news, by the way. You think, what is this rubbish? But then when you hear it repeated over and over again, you know, like when we were in the middle of the something, something in, in 2020, I'm not going to say what it was. <laughs> and you just got to that point where you started thinking actually this this is this real because it's been repeated so much it starts to sound normal and you start to think oh actually maybe this maybe there's an element of truth to this that's how eurocentrists work okay they they wear you down with their stupid arguments over and over again and before you know it, you start buying into them that's why i really do pull up and i think someone over here Ser serious Hayoka, I don't know if I've said your name right. You've got it. This is where I was going to come on to. Henna for red and indigo for black. And actually, I found out not just indigo for black. So this is where I'm going to jump back on now. Okay, I've gone through a, a couple of the comments. I'm sorry if I haven't read you out, by the way. Um, there's just too many for me to go with them. And I already keep you guys on for too long. 
But let's talk about this because this is going to be really interesting to you. So I'm going to show you actually a video, which, you know what? Sometimes I just get blessed with really, really random <laughs> videos that just give me answers. And this is literally what this live stream is about today. So the video that I showed you, the videos that I showed you earlier with the Chebe powder, I don't even know where they came from. They just came up in my feed and I was like, kaboom. <laughs> and then this video that I'm about to show you now as well is pretty much on the same stride. So this is a guy who shows, uh, what's his name here, VFit. Do subscribe to him. Um, he seems like a cool guy to be totally honest with you. And he shows you how you can get jet black hair through a very natural, and I would say African, I found out this is an ancient process afterwards. So after I saw this, I was able to do the research. So I actually want to give a shout out to VFit. Um, hit him with a subscribe um, and leave a comment and tell him that I was big in the mess. Turn um, black the all natural way, only using two ingredients, all from nature, no chemicals, 100% all natural. As natural as you can get. Two ingredients. That's it. All plant base. What we're going to do, we're going to use plants. We're going to use 100% natural henna, and we're also going to use 100% natural indigo. And now, just to pause there really quickly, both henna and indigo are plants that are indigenous to that part of Africa. Okay, so plants that are indigenous to the northeast African region. Okay, um, and it's really interesting. Um, I didn't know that indigo was even the name of the plant itself. I thought indigo was literally a color and I kept looking for the plant, but the plant itself is actually called indigo and henna. And these two things were used all the way back to the ancient Egyptian time. I'm going to show you a study very soon, just kind of to show you that these two things have been used hand in hand. And yet I would bet my right arm they've never looked for the traces of indigo, or at least they avoid them or ignore them when they see it because, you know, finding henna and saying oh the egyptians wanted to make their hair red or the comedic people wanted to make their hair red and ignoring the fact that maybe the indigo is not as strong and i'm going to come on to this in a little bit anyway so i'm gonna i'm gonna keep playing i'm gonna keep playing let me let me not post too many spoilers and both of these are derived from plant leaves you got the henna you take the leaves of the plant you dry them out you grind them up and you get this powder that you see here. The same thing with the indigo. You take the plant, you dry out the leaves, you grind them up and you get this powder. And when you mix these with water and you apply it to the hair, you can turn those gray hairs black again. And we're gonna do that in this two-step process. Plastic hair net. So I've just, scoop, I've just um, sped along. So this is after the application of the henna. For the head, it. this step is optional. You don't have to do this, but the henna does get messy and it gets all over. So you may want to do this, but it's optional. So you're just going to let this sit in the hair about two to three hours. OK, so I washed my hair and I rinsed out all of the henna, the excess henna that was on. Now, this look of just, um, you know, a black person with the henna beard and the henna hair to most people who are, you know, of the African continent. This is not a very peculiar look. This is something actually that we see. It's actually quite favorable for people to just add some kind of pigment. I actually think the henna looks kind of cool. I could maybe even see myself using just henna <laughs> when I turn gray in the future. I actually think it's quite a cool and exciting look. Um, but yes, we're only there. halfway there at the moment. And um, I just washed my hair with warm water and you can see the results after the henna was applied. It dyed all of the grays this uh, orangish reddish color. As you can see, all in the beard, up under there. Brilliant. So I'm just going to skip along now to the second part, which is the application of the indigo. Massage it in so you get to the roots. 
So it's a two-step. Okay, here. So, yeah. Just to be clear, it's a two-step process, as you can see. The first step is to apply the henna, okay? The second step after the application of the henna is to apply the indigo. And it requires both of them. You can't just use the indigo because you'll end up with, you know, a, a bluish green tint. Although there are different shades of indigo that can be achieved. But the easiest way is to apply the henna and then apply the, apply the indigo to get that very dark pigment. Now, there are other ways which we're going to touch on a little bit later. So just please do stay in, stay on if you're if you're here. Try not to uh, lose uh, interest because this will get even more interesting when you'll see the different ways that the ancient Kemetic people had for restoring their black hair. It all in there. You want to cover all of the orange. Color all of that orange, the henna, you want to cover it with this indigo. The indigo is a lot thicker than the henna. When you put it on, it's going to be a lot thicker, more pasty. Let me take off the plastic bag so you can see how it looks. And you're going to get a lot of some drips, so just be careful. You can see the dye in the bag. I'm going to take this off. So you can see it's almost jet black there. I'm just going to skip ahead once again just to the final application so you can kind of see how this looks. At Indigo, if you still look, see some of the henna... Looks damn good, I have to say. <laughs> I've, got, I've, I've got my Indigo and henna on order. Trust me. <laughs> Popping through some of the orange red color of uh, the hairs from the henna. You can always do a second application of the Indigo. Um, but I think it turned out pretty good. Let me know what you think. Um... Like I say, I don't do this all the time. You know, see, this is just something natural. I want. Okay, now, I could obviously show you that video to the end. If you want to see that full video, it's by a guy called VFit. I'm sure you'll find his channel really easily if you're out there and you're going grey and you don't want to use Just For Men anymore. <laughs> Shout out to VFit. Check him out because um, this process is fantastic and obviously it's natural. There's no harm that's going to come for you for the application of these things. But anyway... That aside, because I'm not getting paid any affiliate money to, to boost that. <laughs> Let's talk about this, because this is really, it actually gets more interesting. So after I saw this process, I wanted to know, obviously, the first one I want to know is, well, how ancient is this process? It's one thing for it to be there um, and people to use it now. But is this as old as the, you know, the application of henna? And the answer is, yes, it is. Um, found this really interesting article here which I'm just going to go through with you guys, if I can find it. There we go. So yeah, let's, let's, let's move through here. So indigo tin, just um, let me know if you can hear me okay. Indigo tin or Isas tinctoria is a blue dye that is found in both indigo and wad and is an obvious choice for Egyptian hair dye as indigo occurs naturally across much of northeastern Africa. So there we go. It's right there, has always been there and has been used. There is considerable epigraphic evidence to suggest that deep blue black was the color towards which most Egyptians aspired. And this is the color that is achieved by putting blue dye on Egyptians natural dark brown hair. Now, bear in mind, if your hair has grayed, this is where it gets interesting. Just like he showed you, if your hair isn't brown and you apply, you know, blue indigo or deep blue or deep green indigo to naked white hair, because you don't have gray hair, you have white hair, it will just simply turn it blue. And this is where that two step process probably would have occurred where you actually applied it to the henna as the first step in a two-stage process. Now, it's my understanding that the indigo in this process never lasts as long as the henna. So the first thing that will fade when you dye your hair like this, from the feedback that I have received and the research I've done, is that the indigo will fade and your hair will start to turn red. The henna is much more long-lasting than the indigo. And where have we seen this before? We've had this discussion before about the, the steles and the artworks in ancient Kemet where the, the red dyes stay longer than the dark dyes that were used as like a second coat, which almost always rubbed off, leaving that kind of red underneath. 
it wasn't the aspiration of the ancient Kemetic people to be depicted with red skin, literally. It was a reddish brown or sometimes a dark brown they were after and it was the undercoat. And it's the same thing that we're seeing here with the hair. The henna being the first stage of a two-stage process. And it's, it's clear as day here in this article that the aspirational colour for the ancient Kemetic people was black. It wasn't red. Okay, there's no evidence to suggest that Kemet was teeming with red-headed people. In fact, I don't think there were barely any. This would have been used on both the person's own natural hair and used to make wigs. Well, yeah, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you believe that wigs were made. So indigo tin is the name or indigo is the name of the plant. Now, here's where it gets a little bit e even more even more interesting. I'm going to read up here because I learned something new about henna here as well. Um, Brunton suggests that the light brown red hair of an elderly woman from Badarian, that's 4,500 4, BCE cemetery of Mostageda, might have been brought about by application of henna dye. Smith believes that the brilliant reddish colour of Henatawi's hair and the dark reddish brown hair of Footmos the Fourth were tinted with henna. However, it should be considered that various types of henna produce different colours. Now, bear in mind here, stay, stay on line here because this is quite important. From yellow through to nearly black. So henna has never only just produced red you can produce colors from yellow through to close to black with just the henna plant. So henna has never been literally just the, it's never been the case that you apply henna to your hair, you're just trying to get your hair red because there were different shades of henna, henna that were used. So henna could be used to get someone's hair nearly black. Now it says here, the yellowish hue of Ramesses' hair is not the result of mummification process as one's believed, but the result of henna or one of its derivatives being applied to the king's grey hair to resemble, now it says here, to resemble the king's natural hair in his youth. This is what I'm talking about, the stupidity of Eurocentrism. Whereas actually, the henna that would apply to his hair, not only is that a very natural process in Africa, but my belief now is that this would have been a part of probably a two-step process and the henna would have been what's retained. Now, am I just pulling this? out of the floor and hoping you know something will stick to the wall no i'm not because we have got one more stage to this research that is very very interesting okay we've got one more stage to this research that's very interesting where is it that's not it um no Sorry, I'm just trying to find my article. Here we go. So here's my next stage to this research that actually is very interesting. Where is it? Oh no, this is the wrong. All right, sorry, bear with me. I'm gonna quickly pull it up. I've got it on another screen. So I'm going to look like I'm disappearing for a moment whilst I just find the article. you now oh here it is so here's the quote um i'm just gonna quickly pull it up on the screen sorry about the delay guys oh that is the link scroll up scroll up scroll up scroll up Come on. Okay, so here it is. The um here. I scrolled right past it, it was literally on the screen. Shows you how <laughs> maybe I'm getting tired now. The Egyptians used now bear with me guys because this is actually really important. The Egyptians used natural dyes which are known to coat and partially penetrate the hair's six to fourteen layers of cuticles. These natural semi-permanent tints do not leave roots as they wash out of the hair. So are you with me here, guys? 
These natural semi-permanent tints do not leave roots as they wash out of the hair. Although a virtually permanent tint may be achieved with frequent application. So what is this suggesting? This suggests if you continue or conduct this process in an iterative manner, i.e. you do it incrementally in stages and you do it regularly or continually, what will happen over time is that this dye actually seeps into the cuticle and becomes a part of the permanent process. So it would have been in Ramesses' interest and anyone else's interest who's dyeing their hair to do this very regularly, i.e. they would have had a permanent redness to their hair and a permanent indigo-ness to their hair as well, depending on the kind of process that they use because actually it ended up being a semi-permanent tint. The main colour, the Egyptians would probably have wanted to, so let's just read this quickly. The main colour the Egyptians would probably have wanted to achieve was black, emulating the dark brown colour or black colour or dark brown of their youthful hair. One recipe was an ointment made out of juniper berries and two identified plants kneaded into a paste with oil and then heated. Perhaps we're talking about indigo there because I'm not sure if this researcher is aware of that two-step process. The natural blue-purple colouring agent in the plants with the rub off in the hair does sound like indigo, while the astringent properties of the juniper. So the point of what we're talking about here is the fact that having this process or doing this process often enough of applying henna and indigo or perhaps other plants, but I think henna and indigo are the the main um the main suspects when it comes to the dyeing of cometic hair to make it to get it get it to retain that black color what would happen over time is it would become a permanent state if it's done regularly enough your hair would actually grow out that color so you'll hear rumors about Ramesses being a natural redhead now this has several layers to it it could be a result of just you melanin state destabilization because you know spoiler alert all black people are natural redheads Okay, we're all natural redheads. It's just that our eumelanin is dominant. So I have to say that again. We are all natural redheads, but our eumelanin is dominant. So it doesn't show through. The pheomelanin underneath doesn't show through until the eumelanin is destabilized. So we have that as a cause one. But cause two, which I think is far more likely, is this continual process of applying henna and indigo to the scalp meant that even if you didn't have any pigment in your hair your hair was growing out using this pigment in fact i'm gonna try it, it sounds really good because i <laughs> i'm giving away my age now but it sounds really good but you can see here this is this is what's being supported by the research you know consistent dyeing of the hair using these natural ointments these natural remedies these hennas these indigos would result in there being a semi-permanent state i.e the cuticle growing in that color as a result of it okay really 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 clear process here a really really clear process here that seems to be supported on every side by the research so it's really interesting so when it comes to you know the mummy of Ramesses and people assuming you know they look at the mummy and they go oh, well that's that's a European once again I will stress just like I said before you will never find a mummy with breasts, <laughs> okay? You will never find a mummy with thick lips and you will never find a mummy with a thick nose. Why? Not because they didn't have thick lips and a thick nose, but because water, fat, sinew doesn't survive 3,000 years of mummification. They will definitely be completely, you know, destroyed by the processes of dehydration and desiccation that's absolutely what will happen so there's no way on earth so when we're looking at the mummy of when i look at least at the mummies i look at do the features of the mummy fall in line with the statues and actually i'll be coming with a reconstruction of Ramesses soon you'll see the features of his mummy do fall in line with his busts 
just like the features of Queen T fall in line with her busts, just like the features of King Tutankhamun fall in line with his busts and thus his reconstructions. So when I do these reconstructions, you will see that no manipulation is needed to show that Ramesses, in spite of the fact that he had red hair, which hopefully now we all fully understand why it was red, in spite of the fact that he has jet black skin, but we're just going to ignore that, aren't we? <laughs> in spite of the fact that, you know, people think, you know, idiots think he has a hook nose because clearly, you know, he doesn't, you know, a, a nose bridge, you know, the nose collapsing onto a nose bridge is, is, is <laughs> it has to mean he has a hook nose. It's got nothing to do with the fact that, you know, his nose is completely collapsed. His sin, you know, or any cartilage or muscle or water or fat that was given his face shape has completely been drawn out of him. And what you're seeing essentially is skin on a skeleton. Nope, desperate Eurocentrists will still point to, you know, create fake images like this. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what do you do with people who are so hell bent on delusion? Okay. So. And then obviously we've spoke, spoken about theomelanin and eumelanin destabilization. You know, these are the these are the sciences that we're very, very aware of. Like I said, all in fact, let me just give you one more article or at least one more quote that I hadn't given to you from another article. Let's just just to be clear, so we know that this is all true. This study concluded that dark brown to black hair melanin consists approximately of eighty five percent eumelanin and drum roll. 50% BZ derived theomelanin. Okay, so this is one of the most comprehensive studies on melanin in human hair that we have. And it concludes the fact, obviously, it doesn't need a study to conclude the fact that what we already know, because it's been concluded by hair specialists globally, that if you take black hair and you destabilize it or, you know, give it oxidative stress, it will turn red. That's just the fact. There's just no two ways about it. There's, that's just a fact. So there are numerous explanations. I don't know what happened to my screen there. Sorry about that. There are numerous explanations as to why Ramesses has red hair. There are numerous explanations as to why Queen T's hair is wavy. There are numerous explanations as to why neither of their hair has retained its original black tint. Most of them we know because we just have to walk out in the sun to be able to get that level of reaction. There's numerous explanations and these aren't excuses. They're just literally explanations, logical explanations as to why the hair of these ancient comedic figures, not all of them, by the way, maybe don't fall within the categorization that we would class as being comfortably African, even though we know that they are. So hopefully now we can look at Queen T's hair without any kind of trepidation and understand that's just clearly African hair, just like all the other queens who we saw had braided hair, exactly the same. The braids have come out and the hair looks like it's in that kind of like wavy format. Big deal. <laughs> Big deal. She still looks exactly like her statues. She still looks exactly like her statues. She still looks exactly like she depicted herself as a African woman. And so there shouldn't be any kind of discussion to be had. So I'm going to, I think on that note, I'm going to just quickly pull up my, where's my reconstruction gun? There we go. My reconstruction of Queen T. Is this perfect yet? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll do another one. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're close though. I think we're close. As you can see, you guys, I'm very much perfectionist when it comes to these and we'll see if we need to do another one. Let's pull this up against the bust. How do we rate this against the bust of Queen T? Let's have a look. I'm just going to pull up the bust of Queen T. I want to see if we're close enough. So there's the bust of our wonderful African Queen T. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> I'm not 100% yet, but I'm, I'm happy-ish. I think we're definitely getting there when it comes to Queen T. Okay, so I think, I think on that note, 
that's it in terms of the presentation and in terms of the research. We wanted to have a bit of a discussion about hair. And I think we've, we've covered a few topics there. So obviously there's other mummies we could have covered that are kind of normally the center of a lot of attention. There's um, the mummy of um, Yuya, which is the um, father of Queen T. That mummy, by the way, has e extremely thick lips, <laughs> extremely thick lips, um, which they simply just ignore because he has bright yellow hair. But once again, the bright yellow hair on, on you know, Yuya is very peculiar. And once again, it would be finding out what kind of chemical process would cause someone's hair to turn bright yellow because it's not a natural yellow. No one has yellow hair. It's not blonde. It's like literally yellow. So it's figuring out what's taking place there to make his hair turn that shocking bright yellow. It would be interesting to learn. Um, I'm sure with a bit of research, it won't be very hard to uncover it and to figure it out. But don't expect to get a straight answer from Egyptologists and Eurocentrists who are hell-bent on closing their eyes to things that they know to try and sell you a story that, you know, essentially paints them closer to the Kemetic culture than they need to be. So, yeah, let's have a look at some of these comments and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So, uh, looks like a younger version or a daughter, maybe. I, I, I did try to age it. Yeah, and, you know, look, in fairness, we all know that, you know, mel I'm going to say melanated doesn't crack. <laughs> so, you know, in all fairness, I think my original reconstruction looked about like they were in their kind of like mid 40s. And this one doesn't look too far if you look close enough. Just looks like a, a, a well kept mid 40s <laughs> so to speak but yeah why not um greetings from west palm beach florida greetings to you really good to have you on here soul stash queen t so no, sorry soul sister queen t indeed great job i think that's about the reconstruction i appreciate that um i say yeah, out of 10 pretty good yeah <laughs> ancient egyptians basically look like modern horn africans well not just horn africans um, I mean, I hope I showed you in the video today, those, those you know, Chadic Africans. I think there's many Sahelians, um, you know, um, Africans. There's even, like people have mentioned today, the Fulani, lots of Southern African influence. I think there is certainly heavy horn influence in the New Kingdom. That's what I would say unequivocally. Definitely the New Kingdom has a heavy kind of horn African influence. But I think going to the Middle and the Older Kingdoms, you get a fair spread of phenotypes. Um but yeah, that's a appreciate that comment. Um, she's gorgeous, spot on, cool. So a lot of people like the reconstruction. Um, let's have a look. I'm trying to see what else we can look at here. I hope I didn't miss out any super fans. I don't think I did. Let me know if I did. Um... One common sense tells me that no man's would not have the numbers to I'm just looking at the comments, by the way, guys. That's why I'm going quiet. <laughs> I'm trying to see something that I can respond to that's not going to be a can of worms. I'm African American and we have red hair that runs on my maternal side of my family. Um, we have both dark skin and light skin members of red hair. And I think that's true. Um, I did. I really did want to stress the fact that me giving an explanation as to why I didn't believe Ramesses has red hair. And I still don't. A lot of it is gut feeling when I say things like this. Um, once again, not trying to provide justification. So I obviously really appreciate this comment. I think it's important that we get that perspective and we get that message out there about african phenotypic diversity we do have these i'm not going to say very kind of uncommon or more peculiar you know phenotypic shifts that occur because once again we are dominant and when you're um when you're the you know when you are dominant you have the full spectrum of uh phenotypic kind of um range that your children can <laughs> suddenly <laughs> can suddenly exhibit and then have everyone uh, questioning if your wife um, had met the milkman or not. <laughs> and it does happen. I've got a friend actually who's um, credit. He looks like he looks like Colin Kaepernick and both of his 
parents look like me. And so everyone's always given side eye to his mum. But it's just, it could just be one of these, one of these, throw, you know, one of these situations of African phenotypic diversity just framing someone. Um, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, let me know. Eurocentrics will say that the red hair comes from some sort of admixture. Um, Eurocentrics are a result of, Europeans are a result of admixture. How about that? <laughs> So they can't, there's never a single phenotype that an African exhibits that a Eurocentrist can say that we are the result of this because they are a child race and that's not insulting. That's not me being, you know, superior or anything. It literally is science is what we understand. You know, they are a recent and a child race. Um, the term Caucasian is one that always I find quite amusing because people are, oh, he had Caucasoid features. Oh, he's Caucasian, this Caucasian, that. The, Cauc the Caucasus expansion took place 3,000 years ago. So let's be clear on that. 3,000 years ago is when the Caucasus expansion took place. So what does that mean? That means prior to 3,000 years ago, anything older than 3,000 years ago, the people who call themselves Caucasians hadn't even expanded from the Caucasus region now. So they can't possibly be Caucasians. So these are the things you've got to be very, very careful of. They like to claim, you know, feature sets. They like to claim, you know, phenotype, for want of a better word. I know I use that word a lot, but they like to can claim things that are indigenous to Africa that they likely inherited or obviously did inherit because everyone inherited something from Africa <laughs> um, from us. And then say when we exhibit these features that they came from them, it's like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. There were traces of henna found in African mummies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like we've been covering in, I would say, a good a good degree of detail in this video. Um, I think henna was used heavily. Thank you for putting the truth out there to the lies they have fed us for centuries. It's a pleasure. And I really um, have enjoyed coming on this live because I genuinely have missed this community so much. Um, having not been on I'm just to give a bit of a roadmap actually now I'm going to try to um, produce a lot of content over the next few weeks just bear with me I think it will take about two or three days for me to get anything new out but I think after that I'm going to definitely really 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 go for it okay really really go for it and it's going to be a lot of fun getting that content out to you guys. Um, so thank you for your patience. I'll see, I'll probably try and see if I can go live again quite soon as well. Ramesses depiction, King Mo King's monologue. Can you Google Ramesses depiction on wall of Nefertiti's to Nefertari tomb? He's depicted without his crown with a black Afro. Should I do that now then? Let's see if I can pull that now. Bear with me. Ramesses depiction Nef Tari tomb I'll see if I can find it. If I do find it, I'll pull it up on the screen. see Osiris the Great Black by the way Nefertari's tomb has been greatly tampered with um, this is actually something that I'm sure I'll do a video on in the future but they closed Nefertari's tomb for years and then they allegedly repaired it and you go in there it looks like it's been painted with bloody Dulux so <laughs> like, and then they tried to make the claim they, they no no new painters touched touch the wall I'm like well mate was I born yesterday this entire tomb has been completely repainted you see this use of this kind of creamy wheat colored skin tone that you never see in ancient Kemet never see it you see gold you see yellow yeah literal yellow which is normally either an undertone or a depiction of those who are of the um, house of Heru um, the Heterus or, uh, um, the priestesses of, of Hathor you see them depicted in gold but you don't ever see this kind of wheaty wheat colored kind of modern egyptian skin tone but it's all over um nefertari's tomb not a most nefertari but nefertari wife of um ramesses and it's just clearly doctored 
it's absolutely ridiculous, you know. It's not, it's just does it even look like an ancient Egyptian tomb? But I can't find that image, by the way. So maybe send it to me. Um, Instagram is always good. Um, smash those likes. Thank you for writing that. I haven't asked anyone to do that. Smash those likes if you haven't. Thank you for the reminder to people. Mr. Firefly, thank you for your hard work. Great job. Thank you very much for that kind comment. Um, African people don't look like others. For example, the continent of Asia is not all the same because of the obvi obvious reason of diversity, China, India, but Africa doesn't have that kind of diversity. What do you mean by this, Kofi, when you say Africa doesn't have that kind of diversity? I would say Africa has greater diversity. Um, but I guess, I, I guess the point you make is because we regard the different races of Asia to be very different. But if you actually look at the, the, the genetic and phenotypic difference between Africans they are actually greater than the, the, the entirety of the rest of the world so I kind of see where you're coming from but I don't quite agree with that CD says great job love your work I appreciate your support thank you so much for that donation it's really really generous of you and I I very much appreciate it musicologist I saw that it looks like a cartoon I think you're I think you're talking about Nefertari's tomb there yeah, it's a joke, isn't it? It really is. I was like, <laughs> Nefertari's tomb opens after 20 years of Egyptian tampering. <laughs> and then they actually had the nerve to say not a single paintbrush. We've just used glue to stick it to the wall. So, oh, shut up. I wasn't born yesterday. Um, Robert Breval said the Egyptians have been caught bleaching the paintings. Of course. Of course. Oh, well, that, that would be a clever way of doing it, wouldn't it? You know, no new paint has touched the wall, but a lot of bleach has. Yeah, that would, that would make a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Um, I've got Robert Bavall's book, Black Genesis. I've actually never, that's one book I've never got around to read, and I will try and pick it up soon. Um, Somali tribe, Somali was called, or is the Magi, yeah. I've heard that we've got the, the, the Magi Bowmen, don't we? So that's quite interesting. Um, King's monologue, redo Queen Nefertiti. The lighting looks off and it doesn't look as realistic as your recent ones. I think I'll touch up. I think feature-wise, I can see why you're saying that, but feature-wise, I really love my Nefertari. I think a lot of people have an issue with the size of the eyes, but I think you need to go to Nubia and see what Nubian women look like. And I think that's where Nefertari's feature set that region of the earth i think that's where her feature set comes from and those eyes are really normal in fact there's a specific nubian girl who i'm not going to mention um i don't know her personally but she's the sister of someone that i follow who's mm -hmm. nubian egyptian and she looks exactly like my um nefertiti um reconstruction but i agree with you it could do with uh, a little bit of touch-ups in terms of just a little bit of realism. So I do like to add a few, like you said, like, you know, this Queen T looks a lot more real than my first Queen T. Um, this is why I never get anywhere because I end up just going over my work over and over again. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, LP says, great book, Black Genesis. I need to read it then. If you, I'll take that as a vote of confidence in that book. She, um, wow, she looks like a Mississippi sister. Nice. Fantastic. Uh, I want to thank you for your beautiful and realistic work. Thank you very much, Mr. Khufu Asor, or Sa, I should say. Sorry for the third post, but I'm really trying to get this answered. How does you as mummy have thick lips if we won't see mummies have thick lips? Looking for a genuine... No, 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 no. So, the so yes, yeah, so none of them have visibly thick lips. But if you look at you, you as mummy, it's like um, Amos Nefertari's mummy. They look at Amos Mefetari's mummy and when they recreate her, they recreate her with this kind of overhanging lip. Now, why does Amos Nefetari's mummy's top lip overhang? That's a quick question. And um, that's actually a question I'm asking to the community right now. Why does M Amos Nefetari's top lip now as a mummy overhang? Someone ask me that question. I know there's a little bit of a delay, so I'm going to wait until I get some feedback for that question. Why does Emma, Amos Nefertari's mummy's top lip overhang? Let 
Any feedback there? I think there's a little bit of a delay. You guys must be hit with some ads. But I'm going to stay here because I'm going to be... I'm interested to see if I can get some... Someone said overbite. Why does Amos Nevatari's mummy's top lip overhang? And there's the answer I was looking for. No flesh. <laughs> it's very simple. Okay. So if I just quickly pull up and bear in mind, I did my reconstruction based on Amos Nefertari's statue, which clearly shows she has quite a large, or well, I wouldn't say large, but just quite a voluminous top lip. So if I just pull up her reconstruction now for everyone to see, you can see she has a very full top lip. And this was my reconstruction. Once again, you know my reconstruction. I don't exaggerate any features. This is exactly what her top lip looked like in the statue when I restored the statue. So if I just quickly pull up my statue restoration, I'm trying to find the image of it, bear with me. So this is my restored statue. I knew from the restored statue that she had a very full top lip. Okay, I knew that straight away. And then if you look at the mummy of Amos Nefertari now, obviously it doesn't have thick lips. But what we do have, just bear with me as I pull it up on the screen. What we do have is where the top lip used to be thick. You now have, the f have it overhanging because the flesh no longer exists. So to answer your question, um, where are you? Yeah, black travel and history. Yes, to answer your question, the reason I say Yuya's mummy has thick lips is because you can see thick lips is what used to be there before the dehydration and desiccation occurred because now you have essentially these really big bags, so to speak, which used to carry something okay so there's a reason why this is why you know you eurocentrists see this top lip and they don't know what to do with it they're like why why is a lip like that and they do these really stupid and weird reconstructions of the kind of like top lip overhanging her bottom lip like some deformed looking person no the reason her lips doing that is because in life her lips were voluminous <laughs> in life her lips were voluminous like many african people okay and this is why when it's mummified you're going to get some of these kind of like weird shapes and reactions that europeans can't explain but we as africans obviously can explain okay and this is why her top looks looks like that okay um thank you you said thanks for answering thank you for for yeah taking that so that's that's the um that's my explanation there and you know what's actually really rewarding about that so because when I did the reconstruction, like I said, of Amos Nefertari, the one that's on the screen, I didn't refer to the mummy at all. And I'd actually completely forgotten that Amos Nefertari's mummy was out there. So when I did pull up Amos Nefertari's mummy, once again, I was very, very kind of, um, I was really vindicated, like I am very often with some of the work that I do. And I speak about the fact that I feel vindicated very often in some of the work that I do. Why? Because when the work agrees with all of your thesis, so remember with the nose, I did the nose. I, I don't know if you've watched the video. If you haven't watched the video about my reconstruction of Amos of Tai, please do watch it. When I did the nose, I it felt like the right nose. I looked at an aggregation of all the different noses out there and said, this is the right nose. And then when I look at her mummy as it stands, all of the features that I defended, that Burundi nose that I speak, that I spoke about, the very thick top lip, they're all present. Everything about Amos Nefertari that I did based on the available artwork, not based on the mummy, based on the artwork, was present. The last thing I need, actually, is I'm actually looking for a really good front view of Amos Nefertari's mummy so I can do the overlay. Because I believe the overlay, I haven't done it yet, but I believe the overlay will be perfect. And when I do that, I'll do another video. So I'm going to try and find a really good, if you have a really good front view of Amos Nefertari's 
the only one I can find at the moment is one that's really famous when it was kind of first exhumed and the head is tilted upwards. So I need one where the head is literally facing straight forward so that I can do an overlay of my reconstruction. I believe it will be literally identical. I believe it will be spot on. But we'll see when we get there. Um, so we've got a bit, a bit of a debate, um, debate here about the Somalis being Magi. And someone says the Somalis aren't Magi. Um, I don't know enough um, about particularly if the Somali are Magi for me to actually chime in on that one. So I'm going to, I'm going to avoid that one. <laughs> Um, yes and this is a really good point by renaissance women I think I'll touch on this one and then we'll call it a day because it's getting quite late um, I noticed they portray Tut and other Egyptian priestesses as having severe overtime I think you meant to write overbite there and you probably got spell corrected they explain away black features as deformities I speak about this all the time and you are absolutely spot on Things that are very common amongst black people and don't aren't, and aren't exhibited amongst non-black people or aren't exhibited amongst Europeans, I should say, they will always explain away with some kind of deformity or some kind of explanation. One of the things I like to say is, oh, ancient Egyptian artwork wasn't realistic. You know, it was all metaphorical it was all blah 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 it was all an attempt to just you know you know to to invoke the gods and do, do you know why they say that because ancient egyptian artwork was african kemetic artwork look they all look like black africans so when they see 300 portraits of tut or 15 busts of queen t or you know several busts of Amos Nefertari and they just look like normal black African people. They say, well, this clearly she wasn't trying to portray what looked like herself here. She was trying to, you know, show the vision of perfection and, you know, divine, divine geometry through it's rubbish. It's a load of rubbish. <laughs> they're just trying to explain the way they're African. And every time you see a portrait where they look slightly European, like the bust of, Nefertiti, the Berlin bust, the one that's probably been tampered. They say, this is the first time the Egyptians did a realistic portrait. This is the stupidity that we have to deal with when it comes to Egyptology and the blind bias of these people who are trying to take African culture away from Africa. It really is ridiculous. You know, overbites, Hasberg jaw, um, all of these different things, you know, that they'll they'll say are deformities and they'll come up with excuses with the reason why these people just exhibit 100% African phenotype, which is really ridiculous. I think on that note, I do have to leave it there. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, hit up the like button. I appreciate everybody who taken the time to tune in today, all of you. I really, really, really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, please do, um, if you can, or if you're interested, Buy something from the merch store. It supports the channel. Um, share this with people who would like this. If you're not subscribed, which I find very strange, make sure you hit that subscribe button. I do know that people haven't been getting all of the updates going out. And it'll probably be a bit worse now since I left a little bit of hiatus. It's my last video, so I don't know if YouTube's going to do me any favours. But do, do your best to get me back on the map, please. If you enjoy the content, hit up the likes, hit up the shares, share it with people. Um, buy stuff from the merch store um, and just continue being the fantastic people you are I really 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 appreciate every single one of you and I think on that note I'm going to say goodbye wonderful people thanks again Actually, let's go out with some music. I think everyone liked the music last time. Let's see if I can find it again.